In my first talk, I introduced there is no best drug for psoriasis, so we need to look at each patient and see which drug for which patient. Uh, and at least in my country, we have many drugs available right now, so I will speak from my experience, uh, and you might also want to, to share your experience. Uh, I have three clinical cases, and you will see how I made a decision in treatment, uh, but I must say that we also have an, an uh, immune-mediated inflammatory, inflammatory disease staff with rheumatologists and gastroenterologists, so an IMIT staff. And there we discuss difficult cases, cases with comorbidities uh, and treatment choices. The first uh, person is a 63-year-old male. Um, and he came to our department. Uh, we didn't see him for years because he was treated by the rheumatologist, but he came to us with a, an extreme flare of his psoriasis. I can show you the, the picture. This is how he looked, uh, and this is how his skin looks. You see a PUFA damaged skin also. Um, so he has 29 years of psoriasis, um, but actually the rheumatologist started following him because he also has a polysynovitis, so a PSA which was treated with methotrexate, with cyclosporin, and then in the early days of uh, the biologicals, he was started on etanercept. Then in 2010, he developed colitis ulcerosa, so ulcerative colitis, under etanercept, and therefore they changed to infliximab, because that works, of course, in IBD, and etanercept does not work in IBD. Moreover, he is a smoker, so he is at risk for malignancies, uh, definitely. First look, um, so this patient was very long on etanercept, which you all know, and there has been a study, a recent study, in, published only in March, that uh, indeed in a cohort of etanercept-treated patients in various diseases, that those patients have an increased risk of developing all of a sudden a Crohn's disease or an ulcerative colitis. So be aware that even if your patient didn't have anything, after years he can all of a sudden, under etanercept, mainly uh, develop uh, Crohn's disease or an ulcerative colitis. So this is the patient. He has a lot of itch, which is also a factor we take into account. and. Uh, so just before he came to us, he also had Legionella pneumonia, he had myocarditis, rhabdomyolysis, and also acute kidney failure. So this is before we saw him. The rheumatologist stopped infliximab and restarted methotrexate. And then he came to us because, of course, the psoriasis came back. Uh, uh, so this is a very complex case. He has uh, ulcerative colitis, PSA, psoriasis. He's a smoker. He has had severe infections. So, and he has severe psoriasis. So what would you do in this case? Um, any idea what you would do? Shout it out. Okay, of course, we have, um, for instance, guzelkimab. Um, we have that. Uh, we, we can prescribe it. And I chose to start guzelkimab here. Why? Um, I wanted to start a biological. I wanted to get rid of all psoriasis in order to, to be able to see his skin much better to detect non-melanoma skin cancers, for which he was at risk. So that's one reason. I could not start, start an IL-17 blocker because that would worsen the inflammatory bowel disease. He has an infectious risk. He has had a pneumonia. Uh, and we know that anti-TNF inhibitors give a higher uh, infectious risk. I will show you some data on that than the IL-23s, for instance. Do we cover arthritis with the IL-23 inhibitors? I will also show the data. So my best guess was Guzelkimab. Uh, and let's come back to the infectious risk. This is relative risk in IBD patients for several of their treatments. And you see that with one anti-TNF, you have a higher risk uh, for infections. But all, all over, it, it seems to be quite OK. But we have a very nice study in um, psoriasis patients, this one uh, just published in the JAMA Dermatology, a, a very big cohort. 
uh, and they looked at infectious risk with acitretin, adalimumab, apremilast, etanercept, infliximab, and ustekinumab. And you see that, uh, so on the right here are the, the drugs that give a higher risk for uh, infection, and infliximab is definitely amongst them. Adalimumab is a little bit uh, on the risky side, but then apremilast and uh, ustekinumab, so the IL-1223 blocker, is less at risk, at risk. And to my knowledge, also from the registry data, we see that the IL-23s and the IL-1223s are quite safe biologicals with regard to infections. So that was my choice, and I think I can uh, have arguments to, to, to that. So, of course, not secukinumab because you can have a worsening of inflammatory bowel disease. So, do not start an IL-17 blocker in patients with a personal history or presence of IBD. When there is a family history of IBD, you need to be vigilant when you start an IL-17 blocker. And this is, again, work with our Belgian group that is ongoing. Uh, we are making up a table with all kinds of conditions in patients that we can encounter and all the drugs we have available. And when we say green, that means, yes, it is good to use. When it's orange, it is so-so mm -mm, to use. And when it's red uh, and, and deep orange, it's rather not good to use. And uh, because this is the exercise that dermatologists need to make right now. We have complex situations, we have many drugs, and you need to combine that in your head. And therefore, I would say we would need a kind of artificial intelligence tool in which we put all the parameters of a patient and the, the, the tool will tell you this drug is the best one. I think that is the future with, with computer-aided uh, applications that will help us. And ABC means A is we have high evidence to say this, B is less evidence, and C is only some case reports uh, to, to support this. We will hope, hopefully publish our matrix uh, next year. So also, Lepol has this matrix I've just shown you in my first presentation. And Guzelkumab, yes, does also work in arthritis. We have now the, um, uh, the recent publication, the randomized phase two study in arthritis, where we see indeed ACR50, that is that it is better than placebo, although it strikes me that the effects on arthritis are never as good as our effects in psoriasis. So we can use Guzelkumab in arthritis as well. So my treatment with Guzelkumab, we started it, uh, his psoriasis uh, came down very quickly and uh, he still had a, a bad quality of life uh, because the itch is something that only wanes very, very um, slowly. But I will wait and see, our patient has no infections, his arthritis goes well and uh, hopefully he will not develop any malignancies, although he's of course under immunosuppression. So this is exercise number one, many comorbidities. I have a second case uh, also with many comorbidities and there I brought her case to the IMIT staff meeting that we have with the rooms and with the gastros uh, because she's a patient with severe psoriasis, um, with arthritis, she has uh, renal insufficiency, she has pneumonia, she has had pneumonia, she has polyposis, uh, polyps in the, in, the, in the gut, and uh, yeah, she might be at risk to develop a certain cancer. But then, before she came to us, she was really like the multi-biological patient. So she had ustekinumab, and then small molecule, apremilast, secukinumab, adalimumab, and it always goes up and down, or she has to start because of no effect on, the, on the, the joints, or no effect on the skin, or some side effects and infections, uh, for instance. So that was, um, again, a difficult case uh, with this uh, problem. I started her on brodalumab, and it all went well. So brodalumab is the IL-17 receptor blocker, working more broad than secukinumab and ixukizumab. Uh, so I would say it's my last resort biological. If nothing works, I use brodalumab. Uh, but then again, um, 
It had a clear effect on the psoriasis, but it did not help her joint complaints. So we needed to change again. And uh, moreover, after a while, she also had failing ombrodalumab with regard to her skin. And then I brought her, I brought this case to the staff meeting and uh, I asked the rheumatologist, shall we start ixikizumab? Because we know it, it has a good effect on the joints. Uh, whereas with brodalumab, we, the data are not there yet. Uh, should we start leflunomide or should we start going for dual uh, biological therapy uh, or dual therapy with a small molecule? Which is something rheumatologists more often do. We as dermatologists are a bit afraid to do that. Uh, and I must say, so these, this was, was the ideas we had. And uh, I must say that the results of the IMIT staff was we start her back on infliximab uh, in combination with methotrexate in a subcutaneous form of 20 milligram. It lowered her inflammatory parameters and she has a good result on psoriasis although I would remain scared about infections here. So just to show you, it's, um, you need a, a multidisciplinary setting to decide what to do, especially because our psoriatic patients have a lot of comorbidities. This was brodalumab failing, and now on infliximab, she has a clear skin again and good uh, joints. And as I said, rheumatologists do that. For instance, there are um, already uh, reports on uh, treating refractory plaque type psoriasis and arthritis in a combination of an IL-23 blocker and a TNF inhibitor. Personally, I am not there yet, and I would, re I would like to see in the registries whether the infectious risk is not too high, whether the cancer occurrence is, is not raising uh, to that. So we have a lot on our plate, um, being uh, dermatologists, seeing complex patients. We have many new drugs, which drug for which base patients. We need to take into account the comorbidities and the risk factors of our patients. Uh, we also need to take into account, will my patient be satisfied with what I offer him? I might be on the safe side, but then not have the efficacy that a patient would want. We have a lot on our plate. Uh, we also have patients losing efficacy, and how do we deal with that? And this is our PSO Plus uh, setting. So a patient really goes through um, a kind of process with the nurse asking many questions. We also have a, a business card where patients can email us in between consultations whenever a kind of side effect occurs or whenever they have a question so that we follow them I would say online, but also offline when they are away from consultation to also diminish the risk. Think about value for our patients. So also in between patients can easily contact us and see us whenever needed. So we, the nurse gathers a lot of information and when the patient comes to the dermatologist, we can by eye eyeballing see the profile of our patients and already start thinking which drug we would uh, prescribe. So our minds as dermatologists can focus on the true value and we don't lose time uh, asking all those questions. So this is how we work. And I think we need to reorganize, as I said, our dermatologic service around this, this concept. We treat to target. I showed you in my first talk, this is a trigger to be ambitious in your treatments. We have complex patients who are often undertreated. I showed you this uh, as well. So working in an integrated practice unit, as I call it, so plus, uh, helps us looking at psoriasis in a holistic way. And I showed you how uh, we work. Last case, one minute. This is about pregnancy. We have a female, 31 years old, uh, came to our department, uh, has had, has had uh, UV therapy and also cyclosporin, and this is how she looks. Bad psoriasis. She has one child and her husband wants a second child. She's not very sure with her psoriasis. Uh, and definitely she has fatigue and she has many other complaints because she is a bit overwhelmed by all things going on in her life. And um, we hospitalized her for a Ditranol treatment and UV treatment. We wanted to start methotrexate, but this is not possible with the pregnancy wish. So what should we do here? 
What did we do? If you look at the guidelines, in 15, uh, we still said uh, pregnant women or women with a pregnancy wish, wish we need to outweigh the risk. And we could suggest etanercept in the beginning of pregnancy and then stop. And meanwhile, we are 2017, and I think Sertolizumab Pegol, Simzia, has now given us, at least in Dear Belgium, doctor, where we have it your available. Time is up. Um, oh, my last slide I would like to see back. Yeah. Um, this has really given us a breakthrough. And um, we know that uh, women are... Um, have the, have the tendency to postpone pregnancy because of their psoriasis, and 30% of them decide not to have children. Women are very concerned about the medication, and there is definitely an unmet need, which was also very much uh, uh, described here by a, an article of Alice Gottlieb, uh, where she says, next slide where she says the burden of psoriasis in these women is really high. And pregnancy, we often say pregnancy makes psoriasis better, but actually the data show that 50% of women have a worsened psoriasis in their pregnancy. And moreover, many women have unplanned pregnancies without any counseling on what to do. So they are in a kind of chaotic situation then. Um, and when you don't treat a severe psoriasis during pregnancy, you will have also comorbidities in the, in the child. So I think, next slide, if you can help me. The rationale um, for using sertolizumab pegol in, in our patient, uh, female patient, is definitely there. And uh, it is a good drug because it doesn't go through the placenta barrier. And also for breastfeeding, it does not come into the breast milk. So we have a very good drug there and very good results. My very last um, slide, I take some minutes from the former speaker here. Um, my talk is about personalizing biologics in our patients. And um, doesn't it strike you that uh, the companies bring those drugs to us? They advise us to use one dose for every patient. So one dose fits all patients. And uh, Actually, what you could do is measure in the blood the serum trough level of your, um, of your drug, of adalimumab, for instance. And what you could do is look when a patient has a too low level and clinically he doesn't go well, you could updose your drug. But on the other hand, you can also um, look in patients that go very well if in the blood he actually does not have a too high dose, so you are over-treating your patient. And together with uh, Philly Spulls, we have done a nice study. We defined uh, the optimal window in the blood for, uh, for adalimumab uh, serum concentration. It should be between three and a half and seven. And we have seen that anything above seven does not give you any clinical extra benefit. And actually, 30% of our cohort was over-treated. So we could taper them down, so give a lower dose of adalimumab. And uh, actually, my um, uh, conclusion there is that uh, we could also cost save on biologics by measuring the doses in the, in the blood and see who is over-treated and taper them down. So uh, this is my last uh, message. I thank you very much. Uh, um, being active in SPIN, I want to share your experience. Uh, um, I hope you share your experience with us and don't forget to visit our website. Thank you.